This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner, and today I'm going to be talking about the Neumann KH80. And I want to go ahead and say up front, listen, there are plenty of times that I mispronounce something. So if it's Newman or Neumann or whatever, I don't need to know. I don't need to know. You know how to pronounce it. You pronounce it that way. I'm going with Neumann. So it is, again, the KH80. It was loaned to me by a patron, Logan. Thank you very much for having these shipped to me. I set them up on my desk in the near field, and that's how I listen to them. Now, I do have a couple different little small near field monitors. They're cheap ones, one's from Monoprice, and then one's like a set from Amazon that I paid maybe 120 bucks for four years ago. But I do still have a pair of the Cali LP UNFs on hand that I haven't sent back yet. And I was able to do some direct comparisons with those. Now, the Cali LP UNF, for those of you who don't know or maybe missed my previous review, those run about 300 bucks per pair. And I'll show it to you. This is the Cali, and this is the back of it. Uh, you know, the build quality on this thing feels adequate. $300 a pair. I think it's probably the, you know, I hate using the term best a lot. And I, I know I say that a lot of times, but truly, I think this is probably one of the best options in its price class, especially for its size. But then we have the Neumann, right? And it's actually a little bit smaller than the Cali. And it does sound better because it is more linear. Now I'll turn around to the back and we can see that there's a couple little different options back here. See, right in that area. So you had the option for, what is this? Let me read it off to you. A uh, freestanding small desk, medium desk, or large desk, which will tailor the low mid frequency to account for the near field. Well, maybe what's the word I'm trying to look for here is the desk bounce, if you will. So it will tailor the response and somewhat correct for typical desk mounting locations. But in my particular case, what I did was I sat it on top of some bookshelf speakers and put it up about this high, and I actually kept it in the free field switch position. Set the volume up to about maximum input gain because that's typically where I test speakers at anyway, and then I control the output based on uh, my little Motu M2 or the software on my computer. With that said, let's look at the front again. We can see that it has the one inch waveguide. I should say one inch tweeter in a waveguide right there. And it's a nice little elliptical waveguide. And then it has a four inch mid bass driver. Let's talk about what I heard. Again, near field. About uh, a little bit more than an arm's length away from me. I think that's about right. I thought they sounded really good. Typical monitors, as long as they are pretty linear in response, I gotta be honest, as long as they're linear response, they often sound pretty much the same to me. Now, if they have major deviations, maybe if something has like a boosted high frequency or the bass extension isn't the same as the other, if I switch back and forth, then I can tell a difference. But for the most part, as long as it's linear on axis in the near field, I'm just being honest, I don't really hear a lot of difference. But that doesn't mean that it's not worth talking about the performance of the speaker. And when we look in objective terms, I think that makes things more readily apparent as to how different they may sound. To me, neutral is neutral. If you have a flat on axis frequency response in the near field, and you're not dominated by a lot of sidewall reflections or anything like that, then you really are basically hearing the direct sound out of that speaker. Now, the one thing that's worth noting about this particular design is that it does a pretty good job of maintaining a nice coverage angle Vertically, I think it's within about plus or minus 30 degrees, which is, is pretty good. Now, a small monitor usually will maintain its vertical profile within, I would say, about maybe plus or minus 20 degrees. Some designs fare better than others, but because of the waveguide and the somewhat close proximity and the crossover being at about 1.8 kilohertz with 48 dB per octave slopes, that means that the issues with comb filtering that you might otherwise have when you have more shallow slopes or when you have a higher crossover, those are pretty much eliminated. So you're able to have a little bit more vertical room. So if you're sitting like this, or maybe you've had a long day and you're slouching down, if you're mixing with these speakers or you're gaming, or you're just enjoying the sound of music through these speakers, you don't necessarily have to worry about getting the best sound, or I should say, you don't necessarily have to worry about the sound being compromised by kind of slouching your chair, or you have to sit upright all the time, which in my opinion, honestly, is a nice feature, or a nice element to have in a good design. I, if you're like me, as the day wears on, you just kind of start to be like this and melt away in your chair, right? 
So I think it's good to have a good vertical dispersion, and these do pretty well in that regard. We'll see more of that in the data shortly. Now, going back to neutrality, these are a neutral speaker on axis in the near field. But in my experience, if you move away from the near field, and what I did was I set these up in my living room, and I played them at like, I think, 75 to 80 decibels at about six feet away. So I wasn't super close, but I wasn't really far like I normally am for standard speaker testing. And in that regard, what I found was that there, the top end to me was just, a, it sounded like a, it was a little bit elevated. And then when I looked at the data, I see something there that kind of indicates maybe why I heard that. And what it seems to me is that the directivity of the tweeter is actually so good that it remains constant and wide, which can be somewhat of a detriment. The downside with that is that at higher frequencies, those sounds are reflected off a sidewall. So if you're listening in an environment where you have sidewalls that are close by, or you're listening far enough away where there is a lot of reflection influence and it doesn't get washed out entirely by the near field. So for example, in the near field, if I'm sitting right here, it doesn't really matter if there's a wall 10 feet over there at all, because all I'm hearing is pretty much this. But if I'm sitting like this and there's a wall right here, I'm gonna hear a lot of reflections. And you can kind of extrapolate that out into if I'm listening to the speaker right here and then back the wall out further away or move it closer in, there's gonna be that ratio of reflected sounds to direct sound. And with the reflected sounds being somewhat high in energy and the higher frequencies, you are gonna hear a little bit more of that higher frequency treble further away in a more reflective room. But I'm kind of going back to the case where I expect that most people are probably not gonna be listening to a speaker like this in the far field, which would be more than like a meter or so. If you're listening to them in the near field, which would be like within a meter or so, maybe even less than that, then you're gonna hear pretty much the direct sound, which is very linear in response. All right, now let's take a look at some of the data. The data that you're about to see is all captured using my Clipple near field scanner. It's a state-of-the-art robotic device that allows me to get measurements from a speaker and provide them to you in an anechoic way, rather than saying, oh, here's a speaker and here's my room. I, I have no idea what the speaker's doing and I have no idea what the room is doing. With the Clipple, I'm a label, I'm a label. I'm able to tell you what the speaker itself is doing without influence of the room. It's a really cool device. Starting off, we have the frequency response and you can ignore the sensitivity because it's a power speaker. This is just a calculation thing. Ignore the sensitivity level. Actually, it's tested at about 82 to 86 decibels, somewhere in that ballpark. Frequency response, look how smooth this looks on axis. Oh, and it's also worth noting before I go further, I'm referencing the middle, right? So your ear, when you're listening to the speaker, should be right here in the middle between the tweeter and the midwoofer. And actually Neumann's spec, their manual says to do that as well. As we can see, the response is within one and a half decibels, plus or minus. I mean, that's really, really good. F3 is at 57 Hertz and F10 is at 48 Hertz. Now, a lot of kick drum, lower bass guitar is gonna be in that 50 Hertz region. So you're gonna not be getting maybe the full extent of that. But I think for the most part, you're probably gonna be okay. Still, if I'm using these, I'm probably gonna use a separate subwoofer to help fill in that bass below 50 Hertz or so. This is the CEA 2034 data set. And I like looking at this because namely, we can see, all right, can I equalize the speaker if it's not linear? But in this particular case, the speaker is so linear that I don't really even know that you need to equalize it for the speaker. Now you can equalize it for the room. And with that said, they're about $1,000 per pair, but B&H does have a combo deal where if you order the speakers, you can get the little microphone too, and then you can do your own in-room calibrations with that microphone. If this response weren't linear, I would be looking through here. I would say, is this dash blue line linear? Because if it is, then I could equalize the response. If it wasn't, then I would know that there's some issue with the dispersion characteristics of the speaker that I wouldn't able, I wouldn't be able to equalize it. But again, as I said, this speaker is pretty much flat on axis. There is a little bit of nonlinearity here around maybe about 800 Hertz or so. Maybe that's a port resonance. I'm not really sure, but I'm honestly, I'm not worried about it that much. And even as we go into the higher frequency, we know that the crossover is about 1.8 kilohertz. Well, on axis, there's no issue. There is no deviation in this dash green line, which hints at very good crossover incorporation. But then what do we know about as you go further away to the side, because if you go beyond 30 degrees to the side or beyond 10 degrees above or below the speaker, what happens? That's why we have these other lines right through here. And we can see that 
there is a change. The speaker is starting to beam, so it's starting to narrow up in its radiation pattern. And when it gets to about two kilohertz or so, we can see that it kind of flattens off again. So it goes from being directive, where it's directing sound more toward the front, to a bit more omnidirectional. So the crossover isn't perfect, but I think that's really only going to be an issue in the quote unquote far field. And that's what I was mentioning earlier. So let's go look at the estimated interim response for that. The estimated interim response takes all of the responses above and below the speaker, to the side, to the back, just everything, 360 degrees around it in every direction. And it basically rolls it up and says, all right, based on typical rooms and typical reflection points, what are you likely to hear in terms of tonality from the speaker? And this is what you get. Normally what you want is a descending line in response. And if it's not descending, then that could mean that you're going to have some issues maybe in just subjective terms, maybe brightness, or maybe there's a resonance in the lower mid range or things just aren't quite clear in the dialogue because you're lacking some clarity in that two to well, maybe three kilohertz region or one to three kilohertz region. There are other attributes that you can figure out from this graphic. And so what I like to do is I like to put a little blue line on here that says, this is how I heard the speaker in the far field. Now, as I said, I was about six feet away, so roughly two meters. It's not quite the same, but it's close enough. And this is kind of how I heard the speaker. If I draw the line going through the mid range, this is pretty much what I heard. Now, this little dip from about one to two kilohertz or so, I didn't hear that as an issue. Normally, I'll, I'll hear like when it's a little bit of a swing, maybe two decibels or so, I'll start to pick up on that as a lack of clarity or attack or transient or something like that. But higher frequency stuff usually will stick out to me a little bit more readily. And in this particular case, I believe this is what I was hearing. Because if we look at this trend line, we can see there's about maybe a two to three decibel difference between this trend line and the high frequency. Now, this graphic is based on far field. And I really want to make sure that people understand that most likely you're going to be listening to the near field. And in that case, most likely what you're going to be hearing is this black line or this dashed green line. So in that regard, you're going to be hearing a smooth, more flat on axis speaker. Horizontal contour plot gives us a good idea of what the radiation is from the midwoofer to the tweeter looking down onto the speaker from a bird's eye view. We can see that the radiation of this speaker is about plus or minus 50 degrees based on this negative six decibel point right here. The contour is pretty much flat. It looks very good to me, but pay attention. See how this kind of flattens out right through here? Some speakers, what they'll do is they'll start to increase in directivity. So they'll start to kind of narrow up through this region and start to form like a V shape or maybe a triangle shape going from the lower frequency to the higher frequency, right here to right there. Whereas this one is flat. You see it just kind of flats right through here. That means that if you are in a room that has reflections or nearby side walls, then these higher frequencies are transmitted to those side walls with pretty much the same intensity as the direct sound. And that's why you might hear a treble bump in a far field listening case. But again, if you're listening near field, probably not an issue. Vertical for a monitor like this is very important. And I'm, I mentioned this earlier about, you know, how you're positioned and throughout the day that may change, or maybe somebody comes in and changes your seat just to mess with you, who knows? But vertical positioning really matters when you're listening in the near field. As you go in the far field, get further away from the speaker, it doesn't matter so much if you're a couple degrees off the reference point, because a couple degrees at 10 feet away is just a couple inches. I mean, well, even less than that. But in the near field, the closer you are, the more that little bit of an angle difference is going to make. And that's where this graphic comes in. We want to see what's the vertical pattern look like as we go from the reference plane to above or below that reference plane. And it actually looks pretty good. So wherever this dark red is or that lighter shade of red next to it is, that's kind of a good idea of where you want to be and how much coverage you're going to have. So I'm saying you're looking at about maybe plus or minus 40 degrees, somewhere in that ballpark, and you're not losing a lot. Whereas there are a lot of other speakers that will have these lines at about plus or minus 20 degrees. And that's that may be harder to maintain when you're sitting so close to the speaker. With this speaker, you've got a pretty broad range that you can kind of move, move between up and down. So let's look at multi-tone distortion. At 96 decibels for the one speaker, we're at above 3%, and you're maybe somewhere in this 5% ballpark here. 
Now keep in mind, this is just one speaker. So if you add another speaker, it's powered and it adds surface area. So that's another six decibels. So you're looking at 102 decibels for a pair of speakers at about one meter away. That's pretty dang high. I don't think you're gonna have to worry about that with a speaker that's in the near field. So realistically, you're probably looking somewhere down here at one of these other guys. This one is about 88 decibels. And then this one's at about 77 decibels or so for the one speaker. So you're somewhere between these two guys. I would say that the multi-tone distortion that you can expect to hear out of these speakers in the near field is certainly low enough where I wouldn't expect any issues. What happens if you use a subwoofer? Does it cut down on some of that multi-tone distortion in the mid-range area that we're seeing? So let's switch over. 80 hertz subwoofer here, full range here. Subwoofer here, full range here. No real change. So using a subwoofer and high passing these speakers isn't going to really lower the multi-tone distortion, which in this case, at least, shows us that the drivers that are used have good distortion profiles on their own. What about compression and dynamic range? If you hit this guy with a quick sweep sine wave, what happens? Does it maintain its composure? Does it have good linearity? Up to about 96 decibels in blue, yes, uh, at least until about maybe 80 hertz or so. At higher output than that, yes, you have the protection circuit kicking in, and it cuts that mid-range. With electronic components, what I like to do is the multi-tone compression test. It's the same thing as I do for distortion. It hits the speaker with about 30 seconds of multi-tone signal, and then it captures the output, waits a second or two, hits it with another 30 seconds, captures the output, and it just goes up in output levels from 70 decibels to 77 or 78, and then about 87, and then about 96 decibels. Using this, in my opinion, is probably a better way to see what the speakers are capable of in terms of output. The quick sound sweep version that you just saw here usually is a little bit harder on powered speakers because their protective circuits kick in pretty quickly on a sound sweep, but with dense music or just music in general, they're not gonna kick in as quickly. So what you wind up with would be something more along the lines of this, where at about 96 decibels output, you lose roughly one decibel in the mid range. So I would say that the max SPL of this speaker is probably closer to about 95 decibels, at least with respect to the original signal, which was 70 decibels. And that does it for this review. I wanna thank Logan again for loaning these pair of speakers out to me. They really are cool. I really like them. I like the small compact size, great neutrality. If you listen to them in the far field, they might be a little bit hot if you have a more reflective environment, but I don't expect that you're probably gonna be doing that. If you wanna hit them pretty hard and heavy with lower bass, get a subwoofer, but I figure you know that because it's only got a four inch midwoofer anyway. Retail, as I said, is about a thousand bucks. I think it's a pretty cool speaker. Uh, it would be cool if it were aluminum, kind of like the Genelex, but it's not. But it does feel pretty robust, even though it is a plastic shell. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. I'll do my best to catch them if I can, but gotta be honest, I may not even see it. Pretty busy lately will be probably for the next month and a half, just with a lot of stuff going on, trying to get out some more reviews and we'll be moving houses soon. So wish me luck with that. Uh, if you want to join me at patreon.com to help support what I'm doing here, I would certainly appreciate it. You can do that at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I will drop an affiliate link to either b &H or Amazon or somebody in case you're interested in buying these and you want to use that affiliate link. The affiliate links, I get it. People think they're terrible, but you've got the data. If you don't believe me, make the purchase decision based off of that and ignore everything that I've said up to this point. And if you wanna use that affiliate link, it does help me, it earns me a small commission. I think it's like 4% through Amazon, uh, but it doesn't cost you any extra money. It just helps me keep doing what I'm doing and I'd appreciate it. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Take care, peace.